This week on This is America and the World, we conclude our conversation about America's foreign policy with Dr. Robert Kagan. Dr. Kagan is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, contributing columnist to the Washington Post, and author of the new book, The Ghost at the Feast, America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900 to 1941. You have a quote in the book that says basically that when, when things are kind of calm and, and peaceful, uh, that's the, the fermenting time for turmoil yep. and destruction, yep. right? Is yep. that pretty close, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. my argument is that although we tend to focus on the 1930s as being the critical decade, my argument is that the peace was lost in the 1920s. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, that was a moment when American power over the international system was even greater, relatively speaking, than it was after World War II. If you look at what the world looked like in 1919, Russia is on its back and in the throes of civil war. Germany obviously is completely defeated. France is bled white by the conflict and the British are suffering economically as well as having lost you know, hundreds of thousands uh, of, of soldiers. And, and, it's re and the United States, what happened in the United States during the war, other than the losses, which were significant, but the United States grew rich during the war. The United States was richer at the end of the war mm -hmm. than at the beginning of the war, while the rest of the world was bankrupt because of the war. Right. And so that was a moment when uh, you had very little resistance to the idea of establishing uh, a, a fundamentally democratic system in Europe. Uh, what it would have taken for the United States to sustain that would have been very little. And yet, and, and, and so the failure to do that was really, was really a tr tragic missed opportunity. Uh, kind of an, a missed opportunity, and also at the same time, a rather active demand for uh, Germany specifically to pay reparations and being oh, totally unforgiving in that regard. Yeah, and it wasn't, and the issue was uh, partly Germany because Americans un understood that if you bankrupted Germany, that was not going to be good for Europe. And so America had an interest, also a market interest in Germany getting back on its feet economically. But the real question was, how are you going to keep Germany from attacking France again? And that was the commitment that that the Americans uh, refused to make. Mm -hmm. And the result was that the French themselves then felt that they had to be the ones to enforce the peace since the Americans were not doing it, which led to a, an occasion which I think most people don't even think about anymore, which was the French invasion of the German, of the German Ruhr Valley in 1923. The French invaded in order to force the Germans to make reparations payments. But the consequences of that intervention in 1923, which the United States refused to stop, uh, even though it could have, was the German hyperinflation, which wiped out the savings of the German middle class, and a radicalization of German politics, which really gave a boost to Hitler and the Nazi party. And you, know, even, and you can say this in retrospect uh, and say, well, you know, well, how could they know? But uh, one of the things that I was able to discover was every American ambassador in Europe was pleading for the United States to take some action. Uh, and we were talking about the German reparations, where the United States was incredibly foolish and selfish was in demanding the paying back of the war debts that Britain and France had accrued. The United States wound up lending something like $8 billion mm -hmm. to the two of them. Uh, and instead of sort of writing it off oh, and yeah, saying yeah, that yeah, was yeah. the cost of our war too, uh, the United States not only demanded repayment, but repayment with interest. So it was not only vis-a-vis -vis Germany, but also uh, pay back your loans well, from France and Britain. And huh? that had an effect on the German reparations question, because although Americans had a real interest in keeping the German reparations low so that the German economy could recover, but because the Americans insisted on getting full debt repayment from France and Britain, right, right, the right. French and the British demanded from the Germans, the French said, we're not going to pay a penny to the Americans that we didn't get from the Germans. Wow, wow. And so that put added pressure on a German political system under the Weimar Republic, which was already in very difficult situation. It was very shaky. And then it was added to this was this economic burden. Uh, take a little break. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Robert Kagan. We're here at the uh, Brookings Institution. And uh, Dr. Kagan, uh, historian, uh, scholar, uh, senior fellow at Brookings, 
uh, just uh, an incredible uh, book that he has offered us, The Ghost at the Feast, America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900 through 1941. Take a little break back on the other side. This is America and the World. This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. 21st Century Citizenship, the Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation, the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy. So, Dr. Kagan, we jump into the 1930s. 1930 elections in Germany. Hitler's Nazi Party gets 17, 18 percent of the vote. 1932, it gets 37 percent of the vote, something like that. How does all this fit into us relaxing during the 20s, all of a sudden Germany is rising again, perhaps because of serious mistakes by the United States, huh? Uh, no, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, again, the ambassadors in the region, our ambassador to Germany, who was a Republican appointee, by the way, uh, was warning that if the United States did not come in and uh, uh, alleviate some of these economic uh, difficulties with Germany, specifically by reducing our demands for war debt repayment by Britain and France, then Germany was going to be very unstable. And he was, he's already warning in the early 20s about the rise of the Nazis, so it's not as if no one could see what was, what was happening. I have to say, unfortunately, uh, Americans at that time were more concerned about the communists than they mm -hmm. were about the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, I, I would say I, I discovered some uh, documents by the, in, in the U.S. government, also in, in business communities, saying, "Woof! Thank gosh, the communists didn't win uh -huh. when the Nazis won." And I, you know, you think about how short-sighted uh, could you possibly be? But that was the attitude. So it isn't really until uh, you know 1932 and the big Nazi victory that Americans start. Uh, worrying about this, but at that point, it's very—it's not clear what they could possibly do because now, of course, the United States itself has sunk into depression, mm -hmm. and its ability to manage international problems has, re you know, has fallen considerably. Mm -hmm. Hitler is very conscious of the fact, in his view, that he has a window of vulnerability while while he and Germany are still weak. Uh, he's very fearful that at some point the French and the British and the Americans are going to say, okay, that's it, yeah, yeah. enough with you. Yeah. And so he's very cautious in this period. And even, as he, even when he takes power as chancellor, uh, there's a big surge of anti-Semitism in Germany, but he tries to keep a distance from it. Uh, he wants to seem like an acceptable leader in the international system. And guess what? A lot of people agreed that he was uh, believed that he was a, an acceptable leader. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there's a quotation from Walter Lippmann that you may have run into in the book talking about how uh, Hitler is the authentic voice of German civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just as I think, you know, maybe a decade ago we would have thought that we don't really like Vladimir Putin, but he's someone you can do business with. He's a he's a normal kind of statesman with his own set of interests. And now we're sort of horrified by what he's done. Uh, it's worth remembering that what we know about Hitler today is not what people necessarily mm -hmm. knew back in the early 1930s. And, uh, you know, as the run-up goes, uh, uh, Roosevelt is first elected in what? Uh, 32. 32. Uh, 32, which is same time Hitler is right. moving along. When, when Roosevelt takes office, Hitler is already in office. So here's the deal on that, uh, that FDR uh, projects a lot of hope for America. Uh, at the same time, he's a, he's a strict isolationist, right? I mean, in his heart, he's an internationalist. Well, but, um, but, but, but uh, to get himself elected, he yeah. had to be an isolationist. Yes. In fact, before the 
1932 election, he has to basically uh, go to on his hands and knees to William Randolph Hearst and promise him that he's never going to be in favor of the League of Nations. Would, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a leading supporter of the League. He was he was the vice presidential candidate in 1920 and ran on the League, so he was a great supporter of the League. But he had to completely change all that in order to get himself elected. Again, politics, right? right? Again, politics. politics influences our foreign policy. Right. And so therefore, even though Roosevelt was an interna internationalist and would prove to be a, a great American internationalist, in his first term in office, as you say, he was indistinguishable from Herbert Hoover in terms of his foreign policies. In fact, in some respects, he was more in isolationist than Hoover was. Uh, so we got Italy, uh, Japan, and uh, Germany uh, coming together. How did that all happen? It's it, that's an interesting parallel to the present situation too, because, of course, uh, f the first fascist, the first sort of anti-democratic leader in Europe is Mussolini, and he takes power in the early 1920s, right after the war, before Hitler has taken power. Um, and when Hitler comes to power, Mussolini thinks this is the opportunity. You know, we will will overturn this system that was created by Versailles, this pro-democratic international system, will overturn it now that Germany, once, once Hitler has taken power. So they have a natural alliance, even though they don't particularly love each other, but they, they have a natural affinity, ideological, a real ideological affinity, and their goal is the same, to overthrow this Versailles uh, settlement. Uh, how does Japan get involved? Well, the Japanese have their own situation. It has nothing to do with Europe. It has nothing to do with the Versailles Agreement. They are trying to expand their influence in the region, in their region, particularly by invading and occupying China, China. etc. Uh, but of course, as it turns out, it, it, Hitler um, uh, can see very early on that if the problem is the United States and Britain, Having Japan out there as a problem for the United States is a good thing because the United States cannot ah. commit itself entirely to defeating Germany and Italy and Europe. So that relationship becomes important right. to Germany and, and Even Hitler. though the Germans and the Japanese are on totally different strategic planes and they're not even particularly affiliated ideologically and they don't really trust each other at the end of the day. But... They are both, and this is the thing that's parallel with the current situation, they weren't allies at first, but they clearly both benefited from what the other one was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a common aim. Their common aim was to undo what had become an American and British, an Anglo-American order. They both wanted it undone for their own reasons, and they both began to realize that they were an asset to each other. And Hitler ultimately decides, and this is one reason people never understand why Hitler declared war on the United States uh, on December 11th. Why did he have to? But he was so eager to get the Japanese into the war mm -hmm. to distract the Americans yeah, that's it. that he promised them that if they got into the war, he would join. And this was one of those occasions where Hitler actually fulfilled his promise. It fascinates me that when the United States was so invested in Afghanistan and Iraq, that the South American countries, because no one was focused on them, were making their own alliances, and Russia, uh, and, and, and Russia, but specifically China, stepped in to the void. Does it seem possible that always uh, leadership is thinking 10 steps ahead of us? I don't want to give them too much credit. I mean, everybody is has the same difficulty making policy, which is that you don't know what the future is, and you don't, you know, it's hard to predict. So, but I, that idea of Germany getting Japan involved to distract us is fascinating. Right, but I mean, they didn't, you know, it, it, they 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 recognized a pre-existing situation and then pounced on it. It wasn't as if they said, "How do we get the Japanese into the conflict with the Americans?" The Japanese already were in the conflict with the Americans. In fact, they were in a conflict with the Americans before Hitler was because because the invasion of Manchuria is a big turning point in the, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. So Hitler was just taking advantage uh, of a situation. I don't think, you know, countries do respond to vacuums of power, 
but they don't necessarily predict vacuums of power. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't want to give anybody too much credit. Everybody's sort of bad at making foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Look at Putin. Has Putin made good decisions in foreign right, policy? Right, right, right. And I think China, I think Xi Jinping is making bad decisions in foreign policy. But that the reason is, uh, you know, and this is true of Americans as well, is that no one is ever making simply straightforward, objective calculations of interest. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. um, pride, history, emotion, ambition, fear, anger, resentment, all these factors that influence human, individual human behavior also influence the behavior of nations. And I think if you look at what China, if, if, if I thought that China, the Chinese government was going to make a practical and quote unquote rational calculation uh, every step of the way, I would be much more at ease about the situation than I am. But because China is so motivated by resentments from the time when it was uh, under the thumb of the British, et cetera, uh, and a desire to bring themselves back to the sort of historic hegemonic position in East Asia that China enjoyed for centuries, that is such a powerful motive that I think it tends to uh, undermine rational calculation. And that can be true of the United States as well. There are so many factors that are not simply, you know, what is our security interest, what are our economic interests, how will this affect that? There are so many other aspects to what, it make, what, what makes a country act uh, that are not those things. And that's why we get into conflicts a lot. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a, a consequence of countries making very careful calculations in most cases. It's usually emotions and passions and beliefs that are driving nations forward. So when you are looking at Ukraine today and people are saying Zelensky, Churchill, how does that ring to you? Well, I mean, you know, people want to make, obviously want to identify something that, with something else that they're familiar with. You know, I don't, I don't, both men found themselves in a situation that they did not anticipate and rose to the occasion. And I think that that is what history, you know, we always say, well, boy, thank goodness there were these great men there or great women there at the time that you needed to make. Usually it, the situation makes the person in a way. Um, who would have guessed that, that Zelensky could be Churchillian in that situation? And by the way, who could have guessed that Churchill would <laughs> yeah. be Churchillian? Yeah. You know, his, he does not have an unblemished record as a statesman throughout his career. He made some terrible decisions. People blamed him for the disastrous uh, uh, operation in Gallipoli uh, that the British undertook in World War I, uh, etc. Churchill was not always Churchill either. So I think what happens is Sometimes, you know, the moment gives uh, an opportunity for someone to demonstrate that they do have this, this ability that we didn't know they had. Uh -huh. the, um, how do you size up Putin? Well, I, I think Putin, unfortunately, is very much driven by not only his ambition for Russia, but his own personal ambition to be a leader on the scale of Peter the Great. I really think he thinks of himself as a modern incarnation of Peter the Great, and with good reason. I mean, he, he certainly is, he's, he's been a, the ruler of Russia for decades. He, he is a czar in, in all respects. And, you know, I'm sure his ambition was to sort of restore Russian greatness in the same way that Peter the Great, in a way, created Russian greatness back back in his time. And so uh, I think those personal ambitions and his ambition for Russia, his resentment at the Cold War settlement, which left Russia very much on the outs in the international system, and he's wanted to bring Russia back into the center of things, that those are motivating him to the point where he's made a, a, a very tragic mistake. Uh, something sticks in my mind about uh, some German, I think it was, uh, it, as the World War I is ending, says uh, the whole world is against us. Yeah. Does Putin think that when he looks at NATO? Does he say the whole world is against me? I mean, you know, uh, th that's what you say when you're explaining why you're losing. So I'm not sure he's there yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but uh, and I'm sure he can say, well, I have China on my side, sort of. I have Iran on my side. There are significant numbers of countries in the world that have not wanted to make a choice. 
uh, between the two. So I don't know whether he feels that way. But the reality is, and this is the reality that China also has to deal with, which is that the United States, together with its allies, is a formidable combination economically, militarily, yeah. and politically. Uh -huh. and, and I think it's more than they can stand, uh, ultimately. So what mistakes do you think she is making? I think she is, again, you know, in, in pursuit of this Chinese ambition, which I understand it's a normal ambition for nations, uh, this desire to overcome its past and, and reassert itself. I think all those things are understandable. But I think that he's playing with fire because I think he's in danger of making the same mistake that these other uh, leaders have made throughout history in underestimating the United States, in believing that he can get away with more than he can get away with, and in not understanding that at the end of the day, the American system is still intact and too powerful for him to overcome. Mm. So that I believe he might even win a first round. Uh, in the sense that I don't know whether the United States has the capacity to defend Taiwan if China chooses to attack it or, or to embargo it or what have you. But that would only be the first round. And then the question is, what comes after that? Mm. And I'm always reminded of the wonderful, I think it was a wonderful quote by Admiral Yamamoto when asked by his superiors, you know, are we going to, he was before World War, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, they basically asked him, are we going to win? Uh, is this all going to work out? <laughs> yeah. And his answer was, I'm going to run wild for six months and a year for, or a year. After that, I make no promises. Right, right, Because right. he knew that after that period, the industrial capacity of the United States would kick in. And over time, America was too much yeah. for Japan. I think that's true in China's case, too. But does she realize that? I don't uh, know if Xi Jinping does. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, as you said that, of, of America was not prepared in, uh, in, in, say, 1940, 1941, but they knew that in 1942, America would be prepared. Right, right. And, 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 you know, Roosevelt launches a, a big naval buildup, really, in 1939, uh, but it isn't going to take effect for a few years. But as you say, the Japanese know that it's coming. And by the way, that was one reason why they moved when they did. Uh, they wanted to hit the United States before this big buildup. And that's right. another problem that we get ourselves into, which is also a problem on China and Taiwan, which is when we finally wake up to the fact that we care about a potential threat and want to do something about it, we're kind of playing catch up. And, ah. and now the Chinese have to say, well, if we wait three years, the Americans are going to build up their capacity. So should we wait three years? Ah. Um, you know, most people say he's going to, if he's going to do it, he's going to do it in 2027. But you wonder whether he knows as well as we do that by 2027, we're going to be stronger. So, you know, maybe that isn't the time. We sh he shouldn't wait. How's Biden doing? I think he's doing fine. I think he's, he, he, I would say he's behaving the way American presidents do in these situations. And, and I think it's very important to remember that presidents almost invariably only go as far as they think the majority of Americans want to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they very rarely do presidents buck public opinion. That was true of Woodrow Wilson, too. Um, and, and so I think that what is he hearing from the American people? We want to help Ukraine. We don't want to wind up at war. And so he's trying to navigate that, that, uh, that area between those two things. In your heart, based on being a historian, the research that you've put into this book, years and years and years, I'm sure, is Biden playing it right? I hate to use the word playing it, but, but as, as, a, as a strategy, as a policy, even if you know, he's judging the temperature of the American people. I think by and large, yes. I mean, I give Biden credit for, you know, understanding that this is a, an important battle and that the United States needs to be in there helping Ukraine. And, and American assistance to Ukraine is very deep, as, as, as we've seen, uh, revealed by some of the intelligence that we've seen. America is deeply involved in this conflict. Um, I think I, I'm sure most people would agree who, who share my view that he, the Biden administration was a little slow getting the, the stuff to them, the, the Ukrainians that they needed. Uh, I think we are slow uh, regenerating our military capacity because clearly we're running low on certain stocks and we really need to, to increase that capacity. 
I think he's done an excellent job of handling the international situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's done a good job of working well with, uh, with the Allies with very little difficulty, uh, both in Asia and, and in Europe. Um, but, you know, there's a certain amount of self-deterrence going on, because, precisely because he doesn't want to do anything which could wind up somehow getting the United States into the conflict. Mm. And so that also explains why he's been a little slow getting stuff to the Ukrainians. Title of Dr. Kagan's book, The Ghost at the Feast. What a wonderful piece of writing and research. And thank you for your time today. Just absolutely incredible. Thank you. Great to be I with you it. again. Thank, thank you. you. I want to share with you some short pieces from interviews that I've done over the years. I call them reflections, and you can find them on the media platform Substack. They're filled with wisdom and inspiration and motivation. So search Dennis Holy on Substack.com. Enjoy and share. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our YouTube channel, This Is America TV. Visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. 21st Century Citizenship, the Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation, the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. <laughs>